welcome to another episode of the MMA Lockcast. I am your host, Manpreet, aka MMA Lock of the Night, and your boy on Twitter at MMA L O T N. This week we're going over UFC Vegas 15, headlined by Derek Lewis and Curtis Blades. In my opinion, a very, very tough fight to go out there and cap for you guys, and a very tough fight uh, to find spots, man. This this is a tough card. Uh, we did get the dropout of Rafael Faziev and Hanato Moikano earlier this week, um, but we did get to Kai Kamaka step in for Sean Woodson against Jonathan Pierce now, so that should be a fun fight. Um, but yeah, very sketchy in terms of finding a spot to truly bet. A lot of guys that have question marks, a lot of chalk, a lot of, uh, you know, Guys not fighting to their potential. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's tough. In terms of fights I'm excited for, uh, Anderson Dos Santos versus Martin Day should be a great fight. Amir Albazi versus Algasu Magulov should be a fun fight. Uh, Bill Algio versus Spike Carlisle. I think that that's in running for fight of the night. Takashi Sato versus Miguel Beza is a phenomenal fight too. And even Kamaka versus Pierce. That's that's a very, very fun fight. But obviously everybody wants to know how the main event goes down because more than likely the winner of that fight sets themselves up for a bit of a sit-out or at least a bit of time on the bench as they wait for a potential title shot as I believe that Francis Ngannou and Stipe Miocic are supposed to throw down i believe in march uh, march or april if i'm not mistaken but regardless the winner you know going to be winning here in november and they have to wait all the way till mid next year late next year to potentially get their title shot but i don't think either of them would want to sit around for too long but they are definitely the next ones in line at heavyweight in my opinion so very uh, high stakes for sure for sure for sure for sure all right before we get into the breakdowns let's go over the last event we always do a quick recap And I'm more than happy to not flaunt, but, you know, face my L from last week. So let's go over this card as quickly as we can. We got the lock of the night play. That's each shit. uh, Minus 144, minus 141 on the under one and a half uh, at five units for uh, Luis Kosi and Sasha Palatnikov. Any other judge or any other ref probably would have stopped that fight in the first round against Louis, uh, uh, you know, for in Luis's favor. You know, uh, there was plenty of times where Sasha was shelled up and Kosi was just landing bombs. Uh, yeah, a lot of judges or referees definitely would have stopped that fight. Um, so it definitely hurts to to take an L there. Uh, unfortunately, the, the the stoppage comes around too late. We get Sasha Palatnikov again in the third round uh, finish there. However, it doesn't mean shit to us once that seven and a half minute mark hits. And uh, yeah, th- that one hurt. That one hurt. Uh, next up, we had an L on uh, Valentin Shevchenko winning side the distance. I had two units at minus 160. I don't think a lot of people expected Jennifer Meyer to go out there and have even a, a performance that would you know, garner her at least one judge scoring one round for her. And that's exactly what she did. You know, I thought Shevchenko would have been a little bit more aggressive, especially on the ground. Um, however, Jennifer Maia survives. Uh, and th- that's the best thing she can say about that performance is the fact that this went 25 minutes. Uh, next L, we had Alex Perez in the main event. I had one unit at plus 251. I thought he had a decent shot of making it competitive. However, Davison Figueredo says, fuck you. And no, you don't. He chokes out Alex Perez with a guillotine, I believe, a minute into that fight. And then Jordan Wright, I had a point. 0.5 unit uh, uh, stab here at plus 214 uh, against Joaquin Buckley. People can shit on me all they want about that. I'm happy with that uh, that line, plus 214. Uh, definitely survived a lot longer than people expected him to, uh, but it still ends up being a loss, so that's minus five units there. Let's go on to the Ws that we had. Uh, the the My most confident dog of the night play, which was uh, Mauricio Shogun Hula against Paul Craig under two and a half rounds. Obviously, that started off a little bit slower than I expected and uh, did have me sweating a little bit. If you guys watched the live stream that I was on with uh, Warrior Bet and uh, our guy MMA Knockout Bets, I believe his name is. Um, yeah, I was sweating it a little bit, but it does end up coming, I believe, in the second round where we get Paul Craig getting the ground and pound finish. That's a uh, profit of 1.65 units uh, at plus 110. So that was a great hit. And then the one that I'm most proud of is my Catlin Chukagian, one unit at plus 211 bet against Cynthia Calvio. That cash is for 2.11 units. Wish I went a little bit deeper on that. I wish I went at least two units as I believe that fight was going to play out similar to that. 
I can't say that I'm a I'm a fortune or a, a you know fortune teller or anything like that. But uh, if that fight was going to stay on the feet, that's exactly how I expected it to go, and that's exactly how it fucking went. So, a uh, big big win for Catlin Chikagi in there to get back in the winning column after taking a loss to Jessica Andrade last time around. I think people read way too much into that recency bias of Catlin Chikagi and getting finished by Jessica fucking Andrade. Let's not forget who that is. All right. So to get finished by Andrade is not a bad thing. All right, so a big win for Catlin Jukagi in there. And we end off the card with minus 4.74 units, a very bad event. You know, not the one, not my most proudest. That's minus 43% ROI. Not not my not my proudest moment, that's for sure. Um, this week, though, we won't be going as heavy volume as we did uh, with the last event. Um, I'm expecting maybe two max, three of bets for this weekend. Uh, nothing too big. Um yeah, I'm I'm happy with the the smaller volume of plays this weekend. All right, before we get into it, so I am on free picks, and as you guys know, I don't drop my picks until Friday of uh, so the day before the fights. Uh, but whenever I do make my bets, I post them right on the Patreon ASAP so people can hop on that. Um, you know, it might get affected by line movement come Friday, uh, but everybody on the Patreon gets the bets pretty much immediately so they can get the same odds that I get. Uh, they also get early access to the breakdowns. The breakdowns that you guys are just about to watch were already uh, dropped on the Patreon a couple of days ago, or most of them were dropped a couple of days ago to my followers uh, and to my patrons on there. So they're able to access this content much, much earlier earlier um they also get a best bets and props article which i drop every friday uh which i outlines the best obviously best bets and best props for every single fight on the card um and uh, also they get access to a great discord channel we have a phenomenal discord channel where everybody is you know it, it stays lively pretty much 24 7 uh we got a community picks channel where a lot of people just drop their nfl plays their golf plays their their korean baseball plays whatever the fuck it is uh we're, we're trying to keep that chat lively and i uh, got a credit my guys over there for staying as as on the ball as they are um so big big shout out to those guys in the discord chat and you can join that all you gotta do is drop on the uh hop on the patreon that's five bucks a month super super cheap for the amount of content that you guys are getting not to mention with the ufc churning out an event pretty much every single week you're getting a lot of bang for your buck that's all i gotta say i'm not going with the i want to charge a shit ton to a small amount of people i'm going with the i'm charging a small amount of people for hopefully a shit ton of people we're already at over 170 patrons which is absolutely insane can't thank you guys enough uh but i hope to start to uh, deliver uh some winning events for you guys the last two events have been a little bit shitty but i'm hoping to end this year off i think there's three or four events left for the year i'm hoping to end it off with a bang uh, you know send you guys off onto christmas break with some nice christmas money to spend on your loved ones uh and that's what i'm hoping to do so again patreon link is in the description below you guys can click that and uh you know help support your boy uh help me make this a full-time thing because i know i'm good on it and if i can dedicate the full amount of time required to it i can give you guys even better results better analysis and even more content all right let me shut the fuck up now let's get into the breakdowns because i know that's what you guys are here for nate manis versus luke sanders we got minus 115 on Sanders and minus 105 on Nate Manis. And this fight opened up at minus 180 for Nate Manis. And we've seen buyback come in. Uh, and a lot of people, you know, shout out to everybody that got in on that plus 160. Or sorry, plus 140 for, uh, for Luke Sanders, as I believe that was a great, great line. Now, let's start off with Kuhan Luke, who hasn't fought since February of 2019, uh, where he put out Henan Barrow in the second round, uh, was able to withstand the f strong first round, as Henan Barrow always has in this post-COVID or post-USADA era, I should say. Um, but unfortunately, Henan Barrow goes out there and gets knocked out in the second round and incurs his fifth straight loss in a row and finally gets cut from the UFC. The monster Henan Barrow is no longer in the UFC. He was actually supposed to make his uh regional mma debut uh you know post ufc um uh actually i believe this weekend for torah mma unfortunately that that card got uh got postponed for some reason uh but either way we're talking about luke sanders here his last four fights he's two and two in the andre sukum todd fight he looked great in that first round unfortunately gets caught in the second by getting a little bit too wild one thing that i noticed in that fight is that he 
sometimes he gets a little too predictable. Like, obviously, we know what his, you know, his favorite combination is. It's that blitzing forward, uh, you know, one, two. Like, he likes to throw a lot of power behind that two, but he comes into close distance with that one. But if he starts to do that and try to spam that combination over and over again, a solid technical striker will be able to see that and counter perfectly, just as Andre Sukumtau was able to do in that second round. Um something that we did see in that fight and even in the Patrick Williams fight was his ability to kind of just control guys up against the cage he's a strong fighter uh you know he he has a he has a a minimal uh wrestling background I believe in 2004 he won a high school state wrestling champion uh championship uh but hasn't really done much else after that he's also a hockey player he's done a, a bunch of different athletics and the guy is clearly athletic from what you can see uh of his physique and and some of the the maneuvers that he's able to pull off in the octagon um his issue has always been he always gets a little bit too caught up uh, and too comfortable at times. Like Yuri Alcantara was able to beat him in the second round. Andre Sukumta able to beat him in the second round. Hani Aya somehow goes out there and pulls like heel hook on him a minute and a half into that fight. But the Patrick Williams fight, that was a fight that he was very much comfortable in uh, until the second round where he gets dropped by a clearly uh, compromised and gassed out Patrick Williams. You know, when, when you get a guy in the beginning of the second round kind of like slumping over and putting his hands on his knees and trying to gasp for air while Luke Sanders, you know, resets and gets back into the fight. Uh, it's very concerning. And then you see Patrick Williams actually drop Luke Sanders. So that was a little concerning. But we did see Sanders still go out there and get the 29-28, I believe it was, all, th all three judges. Um possibly 30-27. I can't remember the exact score there. But uh, wins that fight, uh, should win that fight. Um Loses to Yaya, then takes a solid barrage from Hennen Brow in that first round. In the second round, we eventually see him, you know, close that distance perfectly, land that one to drop Hennen Brow and follow up with a beautiful ground and pound sequence that was probably one of the more brutal ones that we'll ever see. Um, now he's been off for, again, close to two years. This is an extended layoff, and I was trying to really dig into it and see, you know, what caused him to have these uh these layoffs um i tried searching injury i couldn't really find anything i did notice that recently his uh girlfriend fiance or wife whoever she is actually gave birth to their son uh so maybe he's just been playing daddy for the last little while but he has been in the gym you see you know pictures of him on ig in the gym with fight ready uh you know i believe the guy's name is andrew defranco or Santino DeFranco is the guy's name, sorry, uh, works very, very closely with him. He's one of the better MMA minds in the MMA game too, so that's something to, to keep in mind here. Uh, the guy is 34, so he's getting up there in age. If he really wants to get things going, he needs to, he needs to go. He'll be turning 35 on December 12th, so that's uh, another thing to keep in mind. Nate Manis, on the other hand, 29 years old, um, did turn 29 this year. He's actually the same age as me, which is hilarious. Um, has four months on me, though. But um, yeah, the, Luke seems like he could bring the type of game plan to stifle a guy like Nate Manis. We'll talk about Nate Manis now, who um, I'm a little bitter towards the guy. He he stopped the run of my guy, Jesse Arnett. Um, if, you know, hardcore MMA fans or regional MMA fans will know that Jesse Arnett was on a ridiculous street, streak in uh, at TKO, even won their bantamweight title. I just want to put it together um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 12 fight win streak and he was pretty much a fight away from making it into the UFC uh, and then Nate Manis goes out there and finishes him in the second round in a very unorthodox fight for Nate or for Jesse Arnett a lot of people who are familiar with Jesse know that his bread and butter is the wrestling is the jiu-jitsu he likes to f get to fights into the grappling realms and that's where he does his work but for some reason tried going out there and Tony Ferguson his way to a victory in terms of, you know, throwing spinning shit, having a lot of confidence in his striking, hands down. Uh, didn't really even entertain the wrestling round where I believe that if he was able to do that, we probably would have seen Jesse and I get the victory that night. Unfortunately, you know, Jesse falls a little bit too much in love with his striking there. And then Nate Manis catches him with a beautiful combination to put him out in that second round. Following that fight for Nate Manis, we see him go out there and try to defend his title against Taylor Lapalus, who from the get-go made a stamp in terms of uh, showing that uh, showing to Nate that Taylor, you know, he's going to be the one moving forward. He's going to be the one kind of asserting his dominance. Uh, anytime he fainted, you see, you see it draw a huge reaction from Nate Manis. So that was very concerning. It seems like fighters are going to be able to 
you know, go out there and if they impose their will right off the bat and start backing up Nate Manis, it could definitely get him to, you know, really second think himself and n- not be as effective as he really could be. Like, as we saw in his next fight against Kellen Van Camp, he goes out there and he shows that, okay, I'm going to assert my dominance. I'm the better fighter here. Clearly, he was. He was 10 and 1 going into that fight against a guy that was 3 and 2. Now, I'm not sure if Kelly Van Camp was some sort of regional, uh, you know, sensation there coming together with a, a 3 and 2 record. They seem to highly tout that fight. Um, but Nate Manis, you know, goes out there and shows that he was the better fighter for sure. Puts his hands together, shows off his boxing background, and, and deads Ketlin, uh, Kellen Van Camp uh, a minute and a half into that fight. Then this Johnny Munoz fight was a very close fight. I was surprised uh, that it was as, uh, you know, as unanimous as it was. I believe Johnny Munoz won the first round, just as all three judges did. The second round, very close. MMA Decisions, I believe, has it as 56% for Nate Manis. But I don't know, man. Johnny Munoz, like, that fight was, that round was very, very close, very back and forth. And we see Johnny Munoz get a a takedown with about 40 or 30 seconds left and do some decent damage from on top. Yet they still score for Nate Manis. Um, And then that third round. Uh, very back and forth, literally just pushing each other up against the cage, uh, you know, reversing positions here and there. That's a round where Munoz, I think within the first 20 seconds, he actually lost a point due to, you know, numerous inadvertent uh, groin strikes. And obviously, at a, after a certain amount of time, you got to take a point. So unfortunately, Munoz had a point taken away from him there. Uh, and then again, in the, the last seconds of that uh, round, Nate Manis goes out there and pulls off a takedown as well. So uh, they they give that round to Nate Manis. That's a 10-8 round. Uh, at worst, I, you know, I could you could see that fight as a potential draw too. Very very close. It shows that Nate Manis definitely struggles uh, with guys that are going going to uh, imply or or apply a, a grapple heavy game plan. Uh, just as if Jesse Arnett was able to successfully do that, we would have seen Jesse Arnett probably get his hand raised that night. Uh, back in 2018, that was. But Nate Manis doesn't really do much that that overly impresses me. Uh, seems to have a good boxing game, and that's really about it. You know, if I think Luke Sanders could definitely pull off a game plan where he just pushes Manis up against the cage and chips away at him. Obviously, Sanders does make a couple mistakes when, you know, if he gets a little bit too predictable with his combinations, like I said earlier in this breakdown, but I think he could be the stronger guy. I could, I think he could land takedowns. Um, I think he could land some good combinations on the feet. He's just got to make sure that he's not repetitive. Um, he's got to tuck the chin a little bit more too, because when he does throw his combinations, he leaves his chin up in the air a little bit. Um, but I do like Luke. The only concerning thing is obviously his layoff here. So uh, Nate Manis, 29, always getting better from fight to fight. So we might be able to see a bigger improvement from him in this fight against Luke. Um, but Luke's need to Luke needs to be uh, cautious with his striking defense because Manis, Manis, if he does land, he could definitely uh, cause some damage to Luke Sanders, who has been put out in previous fights. So that's something that he's going to have to be aware of. But... Uh, I, I'm still leaning Luke Sanders here, and I understand why the line is starting to flip now when we're getting the Sanders as a favorite. Um, but like, kudos to anybody that got that plus one forty on Sanders because that's a beautiful line. Um, not sure what the what the odds makers were thinking at that point in time. I think they were thinking that uh, Nate Manis could go out there and outstrike Luke Sanders, which is absolutely possible. But I'm not sure if he'll be able to do it for three rounds against a guy that can successfully pressure him, which I think Luke Sanders will be able to do. So uh, I, I think we'll see Sanders go out there, uh, you know, put together a, it might be a boring game plan, but he needs to get a victory. He needs to get his feet wet. He needs to get the minutes inside the cage, especially after close to two years off. Um, so I could see Luke uh, kind of pl- taking it safe, landing a couple of good bombs from uh, in the standing position, but really getting his work done in the clinch, uh, pushing Manus up against the cage, overpowering him, and then potentially taking him down and doing some good work from there too. So I do like Luke. Um, the line's not too bad at a pick him. I do favor him for sure. Uh, I'll see if I end up betting the guy. But again, the, 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 the layoff is a little bit concerning for sure. So once again, I'll go with Luke Sanders to win this fight via decision. And shout out to anybody that got that opener at plus 140 on Luke because that is a solid, solid spot. So once again, Luke Sanders to win this fight via decision. Sumadarji versus Malcolm Gordon. We got minus 330 
on the China representative, and then we got plus 270 on Malcolm Gordon, the Canadian. So let's start off with Sumadarji, 12 and 4, coming off a victory over Andre Sukumta last time around. Uh, before that, his UFC debut was against Luis Smoka, where we saw Smoka wanting none of the action on the feet as he pretty much dove for a takedown right as soon as the bell rang. Uh, eventually, Luis Smoka gets a, gets to second round armbar, um, and that seems to be the method of victory that Malcolm Gordon may need to pursue to get his hand raised that night. Andre Sukumtar, obviously mainly a striker. We saw Sumadarji go out there and sp- throw a bunch of spinning shit and a bunch of... Uh, uh, unorthodox strikes uh, very effectively too though because he landed on Andre a bunch of times was able to drop in a, drop him a couple times too uh, and then in that third round we saw him kind of drop him uh, and then just play out in his guard for a little bit uh, but definitely took home a decision victory that night now here he is against Malcolm Gordon who wants to take the approach of Louis Smoka to try to get this fight to the ground and pull off another submission victory over Sumo Darji uh, Gordon is somebody that I am familiar with. I've been around him a bunch. Um, you know, he's done. A, he's worked for the score or fought for the score fighting series and substance gauge combat. Two companies that I've uh, worked very very closely with. And the kid's a cool kid. Like I, I can't say anything bad about him. He's a good dude. Um, you know, working with Team Tompkins, uh, he has switched over some of his striking camp over to uh, Bazooka Joe. Uh, if most people remember him, he's actually from uh, Glory Kickboxing, won a championship over there, but then obviously got all these weird head case uh, issues, concussions and and uh, migraines and crazy pains that he wasn't able to deal with anymore. So unfortunately, he had to retire prematurely. Uh, so that's where and now he's actually taking up coaching and Malcolm Gordon has become one of his pupils. Now, I believe Gordon went to him before his uh, last fight or his second last fight. And since then, um, he's been looking to make improvements with his hands. But those improvements were definitely not seen against Amir Albazi. In that Albazi fight, we know Albazi's game. He wants to get fights to the ground and he wants to try to like ground and pound or pull off a submission. But here he was seemingly unmatched in terms of being a purple belt while Malcolm Gordon was a black belt. However, once this fight did hit the ground, we still saw Amir Albazi have plenty of success. One, passing to full mount completely on Malcolm Gordon. And then two, once uh, Gordon actually reversed the position, Amir Albazi was like, all right, excellent. This is exactly what I wanted because during that time he was able to clear the shoulder of Malcolm Gordon, throw up a triangle choke, and just perfectly execute that and get the tap from Gordon. Um, I think Albazi is somebody that's continuously progressing and becoming a better fighter on each side, uh, each after each day. Whereas Malcolm Gordon, I don't know if he's really going to be able to make those improvements at 30 years old, especially in the striking department, where I feel like you really need to be more of a uh, kind of a lifelong striker to really develop the 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 skills required to go into a live professional MMA match and pull it off to you know the best of your abilities. Now I think Sumadarji is going to absolutely torch Malcolm Gordon on the feet. I don't think Gordon will have much to to say there. It seems like he's still not comfortable with being hit, which is weird to say for somebody that's been you know in the game for sixteen fights now. Um, yeah. The only real problem I think that Mudarji would have is if this fight hits the ground. However, I think he'll do a good enough job in terms of keeping this fight on the feet, using his kicks, using his punches, using his range, and using his movement to make sure that uh, Malcolm Gordon's not able to successfully get him down into an advantageous position. Um, I like what I've been seeing from Mudarji. However, I still need to see more. Honestly, only we only have about three fights of him of tape, uh, so there's not enough really to sink our teeth into in terms of what's available to us. But what we have seen, especially from his last fight against Andre Sukumtat, who in my opinion was the better striker going into that fight and definitely a better striker than Malcolm Gordon. I'm definitely impressed with what we saw from Sue. So, um, yeah, this is a tough test for Malcolm to really get his first victory in the UFC. I'm pulling for him, you know, being a fellow Canadian and obviously kind of uh, being in the backgrounds of his regional MMA career. But uh, I think he has his work cut out for him. But... I will say the minus 330 line is a little bit crazy considering the question marks we still have around Sue Mudarji. So I'm going to go with uh, Sue. I think he could potentially get the finish too. I think he can knock him out. So I'll go with uh, Sue Mudarji to win this fight via TKO, probably first or second round. Um, but I'm hoping that's not true. I hope Malcolm has made some improvements. I just don't see them, uh, you know, being effective enough for him to go out there and get a victory, you know, four months after being uh, choked out by Amir Albazi. So once again, I'll go with Mudarji with a knockout via first or second round.
Kai Kamaka versus Jonathan Pierce. We got minus 330 on Kai Kamaka and plus 270 on Jonathan Pierce. And as most people will remember, Jonathan Pierce was actually scheduled to fight Sean Woodson in a fight that he was still a relatively giant underdog in. Yet here comes Kai Kamaka on short order, still taking the place of Sean Woodson as the heavy, heavy favorite. So let's start off with Kamaka. He's coming off a fight of the night performance against Tony Kelly back in August at UFC 252, where him and Kelly kicked off the night in spectacular fashion, throwing bungalows the entire night. Uh, great, great performance. Both guys rock, both guys hurt, but Kamaka getting the better of the two uh, more often than not. Um, the guy, seem, considering his style, it's weird that, you know, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. His last seven fights have all gone to a decision. Even the fight before that seven, though, uh, this fight was stopped due to an arm injury. <laughs> Absolutely crazy, um, considering his style. Very efficient striker, very powerful striker. Got great leg kicks as well, too. Re does a really good job of waiting for his moments. High fight IQ, in my opinion, in terms of when on, when to you know go for those shots and when to just wait and, and focus a little bit more on the striking defense. Has a high, tight guard. Very quick, very fast. Um, you know, explosive, too. The kid definitely has all the makings of being a, a top contender, in my opinion. I think he's very, very talented. Jonathan Pierce on the flip side, coming off a knockout or, so, yeah, a ground and pound loss to Joe Lozon in his UFC debut back in October of last year um, in Joe Lozon's backyard as well, too. That's something that people need to remember is that uh, Jonathan Pierce making his UFC debut against a UFC legend in Joe Lozon in his backyard, too, in Boston. So that was a lot to take on, you know, if you guys go back and listen to my breakdown of that fight, I actually uh, almost called it to a T in terms of what Joe Lozon's path to victory is, and that's half a round. And I'm sure he listened to the podcast because he goes out there and finishes Jonathan Pierce in a minute and a half with, uh, you know, some of the cleaner striking we've ever seen from him. But you could also, you know, attribute that to maybe Jonathan Pierce kind of freezing up in the moment, uh, getting hit with such clean shots, getting hurt pretty easily, too. Then we eventually see Joe Lozon take him to the ground and have him in this weird half Nelson position where he's just letting his hands go um and eventually getting the ground and pound stoppage there so very tough l for jonathan pierce to really uh you know kick off his ufc career now here he's hoping to shake that off a year later just over a year later against kai kamaka and uh, i think this is a very tough test for him too you know he shows to be a guy that likes to strike and and throw some decent shot decent shots on, from on top uh and in the standing realm in the striking realm whereas kai kamaka i believe will have him beat completely in that in that case um so i was just recently on the Die Hard mma podcast with clint for odds and uh, i did say that this fight was being contested at 140 or 155 pounds however that just got um that just got confirmed to us by kai kamaka who did have an interview i can't remember who exactly it was but he did clarify that this fight is at 145 pounds so i believe topology does have it incorrect listed as a 155 pound fight currently at least before i jumped on that podcast with clint that fight got put together super last minute i believe it was just you know saturday night it got put together but it is a 145 pound fight so i'm not looking too deep into uh the fact that, you know, it was potentially at 155 pounds. Now that it's at 145, uh, Jonathan Pierce, in terms of his size, uh, six foot, 71 and a half inch reach. And then we got uh, Kai Kamaka at 5'7 with a 69 inch reach. Kamaka did used to fight at 135 pounds too. So that's something that people need to remember. Uh, but he is a great striker. I think he has a great all around game, can get the fight to the ground when he needs to as well. But I think that his true calling is keeping the fight in the striking realm. And I think that's where he's going to have the much better uh, advantage against Jonathan Pierce, who seems to get hit a little bit too much for my liking. So I'm not mo the most comfortable at play playing Kai Kamaka at the minus 330 range, to be honest. But I wouldn't be surprised that uh, if he ends up in a couple of my uh, my my degenerate parlays um but playing a, him as an official play at minus 330 i'm not 100% sure about that the short notice is a little bit sketchy for me uh especially for a guy that's still trying to make a stamp in the ufc this would be his uh, second fight in the ufc i think he has a high high probability of uh 
of finishing this fight too. Most of his fights have gone to a decision, but given the striking defense uh, flaws that I've seen on Jonathan Pierce's part, I think Kai Kamaka could absolutely hurt him, uh, drop him, and then follow up with some punches. But he likes to play it safe, um, so that's something to keep in mind. The prop for Kai Kamaka to win inside the distance is plus 195. And my God, it's been, well, it's slightly steamed. So plus 185 now. It did open up plus 220. So I think a lot of people are seeing what I'm seeing as well, too, that the, the finish is open there for Kamaka if he wants to take it. So once again, I'll go with Kai Kamaka to win this fight, probably by first or second round knockout. Um, I'm just not the biggest believer in Pierce. He needs to show me a little bit more. And I'm kind of chalking up his first loss to uh, Joe Lozon uh, as more so UFC jitters, uh, you know, being booed by the entire crowd. Crowd, feeling all of that pressure to go out there as a huge favorite too to uh to put away Joe Lozon that's that's definitely a lot of pressure for a guy making his UFC debut who's only dreamed of ever being in the UFC he was 28 years old 26 year, or 27 probably around the time that he actually fought him uh but yeah very very skeptical for sure so uh once again I'll go with Kai Kamaka win this fight probably first or second round KO Gina Mazzini versus Rachel Ostovich. We got minus 145 for Gina Mazzini and plus 125 for the returning Rachel Ostovich, who hasn't fought since January of 2019. So we're closing in on two years now since we've seen her last in the cage. She was scheduled twice to fight, once in August of 2019 and once in February. Uh, both those fights she had to pull out due to injury. Uh, and now here she is against an opponent uh, roughly around her skill level, I would say, uh, and that's not really a compliment. You know, I, I like Rachel. I'm, she's a fine-looking girl, I'm sure. She has marketability for days. But when, you know, just as the UFC found out which Paige Va with Paige Van Zandt, which, you know, ironically is Rachel Ostovich's last fight, um, you need the skill to match the looks to be able to, you know, have success with this type of, uh, this type of fighter. So, uh, this might be the first time I could be off on this. I feel like there's somebody else in the UFC as well. Uh, maybe CM Punk or, um, maybe Mike Jackson, I believe the kid's name was, but, uh, this might be the first time where we've had a fighter with a sub 500 record actually competing in the UFC. And it hurts for me to say that. Like I said, I like Rachel. I think she's a great person. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, this is this is a tough one. Uh, so she, like I said, she's coming off a two-year layoff. Before that, she was on a two-fight skid where she had lost to Montana De La Rosa via rear naked choke with about 40 seconds left in the uh, round three. And then in uh, the, the next fight, Paige Van Zandt, she did pretty well in that first round. She was getting Paige down at, at will, doing some good uh, work on top. Um, you know, not too bad striking. Obviously, Paige had the advantage there. But then once the fight got to the ground in that second round, uh, she got a little bit overzealous. Um, we did see Paige quickly take her back and then eventually transition to that armbar. Uh, you know, solid armbar victory for Paige there. But, um, you know, very unfortunate for Rachel. Um, in terms of this fight and how she matches up with Gina Mazzini, so we know when Gina's having a good day and she's uh you know actually winning a fight it's due to her aggression when it comes to the grappling and the wrestling so when, when she beat yan yanan Wu, which is the last fight that we actually have footage of her winning uh because i you know i've searched the web to the depths and i have not been able to find her valerie barney fight which was uh the fight she had in between her last two ufc fights um but the yanan Wu fight that was her just kind of clinching her opponent up against the cage chipping it away at, at her from there getting a couple takedowns um being a little bit more um uh you know a little bit more aggressive on the feet uh but more so most of her work was done in the clinch and in the grappling realms so um that's where she's successful now if she starts to take this fight to the ground I'd, i'm not completely you know um writing off uh rachel ostovich's ground game like i think she has decent jujitsu not the greatest but decent enough to possibly catch Gina with something or even reverse her or even take her back um and that's a little bit of a concern here for for Gina Mazzini because uh, again I don't think she's the greatest fighter and the six and four record definitely reflects that um but I, I like the fact that she's been a little bit more active than Rachel has been um, you know, she's managed to accrue at least, uh, three fights, albeit two of her UFC fights were absolute scorchings. Like uh, Macy Chiasson finishes her a minute and 50 seconds into the first round, and Julia Villa absolutely 
bum rushes her uh, 22 seconds into that fight. Uh, she was able to pull off a victory in between that against Valerie Barney, like I said, for King of the Cage. Um, but let's let's look into Valerie Barney a little bit. Uh, that girl was 44 or is 44, probably 43 around the time that they had fought. And she had not fought in over nine years before she fought, uh, stepped in there against Gina Mazzini. So a ton of, uh, you know, red flags there uh, in that one win uh, for Gina Mazzini before her UFC return. So, yeah, neither girl is is impressive, to be honest. I, I, I don't, I really don't know which side to choose here. Like, if you want to talk about value, I line this out almost at a 50-50 fight. And, and I got to give the slight edge toward Rachel because it looks like she shows at least some... Uh, you know, at least some positives when it comes to the grappling where she, you know, is flexible and able to like, you know, throw up her legs for, for possible submissions or even go for reversals. Even during these scrambles, she seems like she's kind of there. Obviously, the Paige Van Zandt one was a little bit different where Paige was actually actually able to, um, you know, capitalize on the scramble. Um, but yeah, we've seen possible cardio issues with Gina Mazzini, who almost puked before her third round against Lena Landsberg. That was very uh, concerning. But Landsberg had a lot of success in terms of just pushing her up against the cage, kneeing at her, taking her down, and you know, landing a couple elbows and stuff. So, uh, like as you guys can tell, I'm pro- like I'm absolutely talking myself through this breakdown right now, so that I'm able to like come up with an actual you know an actual side here in terms of who I think is going to win. So I do like. Man, going into this, I I thought I was gonna like Gina Mazzani a little bit more, but she she shows some holes in her game, and she and but but again the the, the concern with Rachel Lostovich is she's been off for so long, she's accrued a couple of injuries. How good is she gonna look when she comes back? So, fuck, I I don't know. In terms of betting, I, if you're forcing me to bet here, I'm gonna bet Rachel Lostovich. Uh, I'm not actually gonna bet, but like if you're forcing me to, I would bet Rachel Rachel Lostovich. Um, fuck. This is a tough one. I'll go at Rachel. I can't believe I'm saying that too. I'll go at Rachel Ostovich. Um, no, you know what? Fuck it. I, I will go with Gina Mazzini. I think uh, the fact that she's not been in- injured as much over the last two years, um, you know, she might be the slightly stronger woman. Uh, it, it gets it gets sketchy though if she does decide to take this to the ground, as I believe that Rachel could possibly pull off a submission off her back. So uh, yeah, this this is the epitome of a stay away fight. This is a pass fight. If you want to, if you're betting this fight, you know, kudos to you for having the balls to go out and actually do it. This is a very very tough one to call because both show tremendous flaws in their game. Um, obviously the two year layoff with Rachel doesn't help either. Um. And even Gina, even though she's fought three times, you know she got scorched two times in the UFC. So how much do how much does that experience really even help her? So maybe she's been able to train a little bit longer and been able to to actually you know spar and do all these things. Whereas Rachel has been uh, kind of nursing injuries here and there. But uh, yeah, I, I gotta go with Gina. Uh, she might be the more fit woman at this point in time. What are their ages now too? Yeah, Gina Mazzani is thirty two. And Rachel Ostovich is 29. So not a huge discrepancy there. Yeah, I'm going to go with uh, Gina Mazzani. I think she wins by decision, but by no means am I uh, confident in this at all. And and again, all praise to anybody uh, who has the balls to confidently bet either side here. I know somebody on my Patreon is already hard on Gina Mazzani. Uh, so good luck to him. But uh, yeah, I'm staying away from this fight. But I do have Gina Mazzani winning this fight via decision. She's just got to be very, very careful about the jiu-jitsu that uh, Ostovich could possibly pull off of her back. And uh, again, Ostovich has a solid wrestling background, it's, uh, background too. Not saying that she can't get taken down or anything like that, but something to, to to keep in mind as well but i am going to go with gina mazzini to win this fight via decision anderson dos santos versus martin day we got minus 175 on martin day and plus 155 on anderson dos santos and this line actually opened up at minus 245 for martin day which is crazy in my opinion hence the anderson dos santos love coming in so both guys are coming off of two losses both guys are winless in the ufc uh, both of them obviously starting their UFC careers 0-2. I'd say that Anderson Dos Santos actually had the slightly tougher run in the UFC thus far. So let's start off with him. He had his first loss to Nat Naramani, um, you know, getting out grappled, getting out worked. Obviously, the much stronger grappler was Nad Naramani that night, and it definitely showed. Andre Ewell, on the other end, was doing a very good job of keeping this fight on the feet, where he would keep it, you know, most... Um, 
most competitive, uh, or at least most lopsided for his side, I should say. Uh, and he went out there and, you know, bombed on uh, Anderson Dos Santos for 15 minutes. Um, you know, at a certain point, Dos Santos kind of just gave up on the takedowns and started training with Andre Ewell, which is not what you want to do. You know, Ewell does a very good job of maintaining his distance and his reach, given the you know massive uh reach advantage he normally has over his opponents um and uh you know he made dos santos pay for it you know dos santos pretty much came out of that fight with a pretty a bloody face uh, a very cut and bruised face um perfect work from andre ewell that night um you know sticking to his game plan to a t now martin day is gonna have to you know kind of stick with the same type of game plan from Andre Ewell, but I'm not 100% sure he's actually worth um, or capable of working that type of game plan here against Anderson Dos Santos. One issue that we have seen from Martin Day in his past is he does get hit with... uh, uh, a lot of counters. His opponents are very successful once they plant uh, and they're willing to take a shot from Martin Day. They're able to, you know, capitalize on the counters and actually drop him, just as Ping Yuan Liu did, uh, I believe, in the third round of their fight. And obviously, how Davy Grant was successful in doing so, especially in knocking him out in that third round too. Now Martin Day looks great on the feet. You know, he has great kicks uses his distance well at times but uh, he does leave himself open for counters quite often and that's where he pays for it the most now i'm not expecting arison dos santos to go you know strike for strike for with my guy martin day here um you know he will have to deal with some more adversity on the feet but at some point i could absolutely see dos santos kind of just chomping down on his mouthpiece throwing a counter in return and landing cleanly on martin day um and that's what makes me a little bit skeptical on paying a little bit of juice on Martin Day here. Because again, he looks like the much better fighter when, when it's on the feet. Um, but Dos Santos, high level black belt, if he gets this fight to the ground, things can get a little bit more interesting. Now, we've never seen Martin Day actually lose via submission in any of his fights. So that's a little bit of a, a question mark here. But I don't know if he's faced anybody with the level of experience and the level of jiu-jitsu that Anderson Dos Santos has here. Now, uh, Dos Santos has only seen the scorecards, I believe, seven times in his 28 fight career. Um, you know, he's definitely a finisher, likes to go out and get the finish. Uh, tough to put away at times. Uh, Martin Day put, could. I think I think Martin Day chases the knockout a little bit more than Andre Ewell does. Um, he likes to go for the finish. Um, but uh this this is a tough spot man uh dos santos definitely throws with a little bit of power obviously not the best technique so he's more so gonna have to rely on getting hit and then kind of just planting his feet and throwing counters as i believe that's where he'll be strongest in the in the, in the stand-up realm uh but he definitely wants to get this fight to the ground we've seen some solid takedown defense from martin day when he had to go up against it and against ping yuan uh, Liu, uh, the Davy Grand fight, he did get taken down twice, so that's something to to keep in mind here. I think Dos Santos will be chasing that takedown a little bit more than we saw uh, any of his past opponents do so. And in terms of takedowns, our guy uh, Anderson Dos Santos landed two on Andre Ewell and uh, landed none against Nat Dermani. That currently puts him at a takedown accuracy of twenty percent. I believe the majority of those were actually stuffed. By both of the both of his opponents, obviously. So he was two of nine against Andre Ewell with takedowns, and he was uh, o of one against Nad Naramani. So uh, again, I'm not the biggest believer in like MMA statistics, especially when they have such a small sample size of only two fights. Uh, so I'm not going to read too much into that 20% takedown accuracy here. Uh, but I think he'll definitely be attacking it against Martin Day here. I think he's going to have to, you know be a little bit more conservative and not spam takedowns as much as he did in the Andre Yule fight. And I don't think he has as much to worry about here uh, with Martin Day, who, again, doesn't use his range as well as Mar- Andre Yule, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, and, and also leaves himself for counters, open for counters as much uh, as Andre Yule, too. So uh, I think Dos Santos has a, a s- solid number of paths to victory here, and I can't say that I'm completely impressed with what I've been seeing from Martin Day. Um, I do like Dos Santos win here. I could see a club and sub opportunity for him. Uh, Again, as long as he plants and starts to throw with his counters, he definitely has a ton of openings that he can capitalize on. So I like Dos Santos here to win by maybe first or second round club and sub. Uh, I think that's his way to go here. Uh, 
yeah, uh, I'm going to go with Dos Santos. Not the heaviest of leans here. Uh, and obviously we missed the best line because the, the, the openers got smashed. Um, but I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm not the most keen on betting this fight. Both guys are going to be, you know, fighting with a lot of tenacity for sure, considering that a loss here most likely means them, uh, you know, packing their bags and getting out of the UFC. But I'll go with the underdog here. I think there's some solid value on Dos Santos here. Again, not sure if I'll make the bet myself, but I do like Dos Santos to win this fight probably by first or second round submission. One thing I do want to note as well is under two and a half is a good spot. Currently sitting at plus 185. I think both guys have finishing capabilities and have been finished in the past too. But uh, I do think that Dos Santos is the one that ultimately sinks in the choke and gets a finish. So I'll go with Dos Santos once again to win this fight via submission. Ashley Evan Smith versus Norma Dumont. We got minus 115 for Evan Smith and minus 105 for Norma Dumont. And the opener on this was absolutely bonkers. Minus 175 is what the odds makers dropped us at for Norma Dumont. Uh, and then obviously plus 145 for Ashley Evan Smith. And I thought that was an absolute joke of a line. So let's start off with Norma Dumont. And I say joke of a line because one, you know, Evan Smith obviously a little bit more UFC tested. We haven't seen too much of Norma Dumont. Uh, but let's talk about her. So she's 4-1 and one going into this fight. Before her UFC debut, which was against Megan Anderson, she took roughly a year and a half off. So that's a red flag already. <clears throat> I think a lot of people already understand with Megan Anderson and especially the featherweight division for the women's, uh, they're kind of struggling to find talent. They're trying to find people to match Megan Anderson up against or even anybody else in the, the featherweight division. Felicia Spencer, another name that comes to mind. But it's such a thin division that you know anybody that they're bringing in has re- maybe a long layoff they've been off or they don't even have that you know respectable of a record uh, or even legitimate enough talent to be in the UFC. But they have these quote-unquote stars in the UFC uh, at that featherweight division that they want to continue to push and they want to push to the to the extent that you know they can continue to get Amanda Nunes some title defenses so she's able to keep both belts and, and market her the way that she is but when Norma Dumont you know she was undefeated coming into the UFC so that's one thing but now she's four and one in that fight against Megan Anderson. Let's talk about that a little bit. You know, not too much you can really dissect from that other than, you know, she seems kind of strong. She seems, you know, she was able to get Megan Anderson down, get a little bit of good top position and some good ground and pound in from there, but nothing too crazy. But then once Megan Anderson landed that one bomb, there was one beautiful right cross right down the middle, landed square on the face in order to mount, like right on her nose, pretty much dropped her. And I think like once you like, more often than not, some referees will allow the fighter to kind of recover or even allow them to kind of fight back and try to get back to their feet. But when you, if you look at the replay, you see Norma Dumont's eyes and they kind of like track away from Megan Anderson. Um, so she doesn't really keep her eyes completely locked on Megan. And I think that's truly something that refs look at. Um, I believe Herb Dean touched on it a little bit when he was on the Joe Rogan experience. Um, there there are a couple things that referees look for and one of them is the the fighter kind of keeping eye contact with their opponent as long as they're not getting like punched and slouched over but if they're getting punched and they fall right backwards and their eyes kind of like shift a little bit they probably look at that as like okay this fighter has been concussed let's stop this fight and that's what i think happened in that megan anderson fight um i wish that we saw it played out a little bit more because it could have gotten really interesting if norma could potentially continuously push uh, Megan up against the cage or even take her down and possibly make it a little bit harder for her. The only other fight that we have tape on Norma for is her Erica Diane fight where, um, you know, showed some good confidence in her striking, but her opponent just didn't seem like she wanted to be there. That chick was 0-2 going into that fight. Let's see if she's even fought since then. Yeah, now that chick is 1-5. So that should tell you all you need to know about the level of competition that Erica, or sorry, that Norma was fighting on the regional scene. Um... I wish we had a tape on the Marie, Mariana Marais fight. That's a fight that she won by the majority decision. Um, but this Ashley Evan, Evan ugh, this Ashley Evan Smith fight is an intriguing one because Evan Smith herself is coming back from a pretty lengthy layoff. She's coming off close to two years now, uh, just short of two years, uh, where she fought Andrea Lee last time around, um, lost that fight via decision. 
uh, and she's pulled out uh, of the Taylor Santos fight that was supposed to happen in August of last year. Uh, she pulled out due to the injury, and then she was scheduled to fight Molly McCann uh, pre-COVID um, in March, and then obviously it gets cancelled uh, due to COVID. Uh, so unfortunate uh, for her there, because it would have been nice to see her in there against Molly McCann. Now she draws Norma Dumont, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I can't really see it now. So that her Angeli, Andrea Lee fight happened at flyweight, um, and this Norma Dumont fight is happening at 135. If you guys remember, obviously Norma did fight at 145 last time around against Megan Anderson, and uh, the fight before that, she was fighting at 135. So I think Norma is more so a 135 than she is a 45. Uh, and Avin Smith has made 125 pounds in the past. So who knows if that's where she wanted to be. But she took this fight at 135 pounds to, you know, taking into consideration the COVID and, and the, the, the state of the world right now. Uh, maybe she just wanted to play a little bit more safe and make that 135 instead. Now in this fight, you know, she has a decent wrestling background of herself. Uh, in terms of takedown defense, opponents are 3 of 11 against Ashley Evans-Smith. So that might be something that Norma is going to look for, as we've seen in her past fights. Um, still trying to figure out how good her jiu-jitsu is. That's Norma, of course. Um, but Ashley Evans-Smith has a background in wrestling, but she doesn't really go to it often. You know, she has a 27% takedown accuracy, so maybe that's not something she wants to hunt for as often. And even when she took down or tried to take down, I believe it was uh, Raquel Pennington, she got bulldog choked. So that maybe is scaring her off more so from the takedowns. Now, she did land two against Andrea Lee. Didn't do the best in terms of maintaining that top position or even landing damage from there. But the, what it seems to be like for Ashley Evans-Smith is, is kind of her output and her striking because she has a ridiculous amount of output. She lands over 79 strikes per fight on average uh, in terms of the fights that goes to a decision. For every fight that goes to a decision, there's four of them that she's had in the UFC. She lands about 79 strikes and she attempts over 250 strikes, an average of 250 strikes per fight or at least per 15 minutes that have gone 15 minutes insane her output is ridiculous her cardio is ridiculous she has solid cardio she should be able to go out there and kind of pick apart norma from outside again we're still trying to get a, a total feel on what norma brings to the table just because we have such a lack of evidence and, and footage to really go off on her i believe ashley evan smith should be the favorite here um so whoever hammered that opening line on evan smith that at plus 145 plus 150 Kudos to you. Even if you got any plus money a year on Ashley Evan Smith, I think it's a positive thing. Again, the only deterrent here is the the, the layoff for Ashley Evan Smith, um, the the lack of evidence on Norma Dumont or lack of footage, I should say, on Norma. But in terms of what we've seen and the information that we're able to gather, the little bit of it, you got to kind of lean Ashley here. But uh, I might stay off of it. I, you know, I wish I got that plus money. If she somehow gets back to plus money, it might be something that I'm going to consider. But at, you know, at evens or even at Ashley's slight favorite, uh, I'm still a little bit skeptical. So I will go with Evan Smith to win this fight via decision. Uh, you know, going with her outstriking, you know, having more output, uh, having the better, potentially the better cardio. Again, we, we just don't know what Norma. She has been to a decision and has won in the past before. So, um, but but that, that output is really ridiculous i think that the kryptonite for ashley is is somebody that one can finish her obviously so that kind of you know uh, nullifies the amount of output and 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 volume that ashley evan smith has but also uh, somebody that has much better technical striking because andrea lee much better technical striker so she was able to be there be, go out there and have much better accuracy a bit more you know, more pinpoint with her striking, uh, landing the better shots, kind of hurting Ashley Evan Smith, even having the 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 aesthetic of Ashley being more hurt, being more bloody, looking like she's been in the fight more. You know, obviously Ashley doesn't have the most pop or power behind her strikes, which is why she's go able to go out there and you know attempt two hundred fifty plus strikes uh, in those fights. It, it, it's it's the te more technical striking, and it doesn't look like Norma has that. You know, she looks more of a, not wild puncher, but, you know, just throwing the punches just to throw them out there. So uh, I'll go with Evan Smith here to win this fight via decision, but it, it's a bit of a stay away because of the lack of information that we have on Dumont. The three and a half the minutes that we got with um, Megan Harrison was just not enough for me to really depict what kind of fighter we have on our hands here. So once again, I'll go with Evan Smith to win this fight via decision, um, but I would only look to bet this fight if we could potentially get some plus money on Ashley Evan Smith.
Spike Carlisle versus Bill Algio. We got minus 155 on Spike and plus 135 on Bill Algio. And the line opened up at minus 174 Spike. And it's slowly uh, coming down to minus 155 with a lot of love coming. Well, not a lot, but a good amount of love coming in on Bill Algio to kind of affect that line. So let's get into this fight. Let's let's start off with uh, Spike Carlisle. 9-2 uh, and two coming off a loss to Billy Quarantillo. Very, very close fight. That second round was super freaking close. Um, I believe I checked MMA to decisions last night and it was as close as like 55 percent for quarantillo in that round in round two obviously spike won round one billy won round three um but what a war what a war i had the under two and a half in that fight and at first i was a little bit pissed off that i didn't cash the ticket but then now that i'm watching it back and saw and saw how amazing that fight was i got to give it up to both of these individuals that was a phenomenal fight spike carlisle definitely uh, his gas tank definitely held up a lot better than most people expected it to to at least you know survive as much as he did from the onslaught of Billy Quarantillo and a lot of people know that you know that's Billy Q, Billy Q's game kind of more often than not lose that first round and the second and third round really start to put it on his opponents and then really start to you know get the uh get it get finishes more often than not, he gets the second or third round finish but spike did a good job of holding tight uh the second round i will say i did edge that for billy q very very close but i did have to edge it to billy um but we did see some good damage from both sides there um in terms of their fighting style spike is an absolute madman the guy just is just what can i say from his fighter intros to you know him, his celebrations to um just his fighting style just absolutely bonkers and bananas and you you try to wonder like is he always is he able to keep it going for 15 minutes if that's what he needs to do and uh you know again he dropped that that decision to billy q uh he dropped another decision earlier in his career to a guy named sarob manassian um it, it, but he did want a decision against a guy named Fernando Padilla for a CXF. So he has won at least one decision in his career. Um, yeah, he, he throws a lot of power into shots. He's deceptively quick. He's very explosive. Um, you know, in that fight against Alan Cruz, that head kick that he landed was, you know, more often than not, people wouldn't expect a guy that is that much shorter to land a head kick so cleanly on a guy. And it obviously rocked Allen. As we saw in the replay, you see Allen's like uh, eyes start to roll back and he starts to stumble backwards. That's where Spike, you know, starts to go for the kill. Alan uh, engages in the clinch and we see Spike drop this beautiful elbow close to the back of the head but like it was legal for sure you see Allen, uh you know start to wobble and then we saw spike just go out there and absolutely you know put it on him uh that power scares me you know it could it could be some issues for some guys that may not respect it or may not respect even the speed in which spike is going to be able to close distance on some of these guys so spike is five five six five six or five eight my eyes are deceiving me right now. He is 5'8 with a 71 inch reach. Bill Algio is 6 foot with a 73 and a half inch reach. So, um, you know, small uh, size advantage here for uh, for for Bill Algio. Uh, Alan Cruz had the same advantage. Obviously, a more uh, higher reach, but uh, the same height. And we still saw uh, Spike Carlisle go out there and even head kick the dude. You know, I mean, I really think the speed threw off Cruz there. And I think it might mess with the Bill Algio here, too. So let's get into Bill Algio a little bit. That was a guy that I faded last time around. I went full five unit lock, and then I play at chalk uh, on Ricardo Lamas against uh, Bill Algio. And he cashed, thankfully. However, that was a close fucking fight. That was a very, very close fight. Thankfully, the, it seemed like the veteranship and the cardio of Ricardo Lamas really helped him pull it off in that third round. I believe it was 1-1 going into that third, and then we got a big 10-8 from Ricardo Lamas, pretty much controlling Algio that entire third round. And now, you know, th that's where the question comes into into that's where the, the the issue comes into question now in terms of who's going to have the better cardio, Bell Algio or Spike Carlisle. And a part of me wants to side with Spike a little bit more here. I feel like, you know, um, even though Algio might seemingly have the ground advantage and the possible grappling and strength, uh, scrambling advantage, I feel like Spike will do a good job in terms of just pushing Algio up against the gauge, or controlling him on the ground. Um, and then when it, when it gets crazy on the ground and starts scrambling, we can see Carlisle get back on the feet. And I feel like his 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 speed and his explosiveness explosiveness will still catch Bill Algio, Bill Algio off guard uh, when they're on the feet and they're trying to control it in that range. Um, Bill, you know, had some better 
striking that I expected him to. He still went out there and did his fucking, you know, uh, gamesmanship in terms of whenever Ricardo Lamas would like miss a kick or something like that, he would do a stupid, you know, oh, look, you missed by a fucking mile. And I'm glad that Ricardo Lamas kind of did it back to him <laughs> as a joke at the ending of that second round. But, uh, Bill did show up to that fight a little bit more than I thought he would. His striking looked okay. His hands are still down. Um, you know, question was takedown defense as well. Um, landed some good shots on Ricardo. One of, that one of those uh, front kicks that landed straight to the chin of Lamas and made his head bobble uh, was very, very beautiful. He almost got the finish there. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to secure it. Uh, questionable fight IQ. You know, after he, after he rocks Ricardo Lamas, he goes for the takedown. And then we see Ricardo pretty much reverse the position almost immediately and, and take over once again. So that's definitely uh, a concern with Bell here. Uh, I wanted to go into this with the with a reason to bet Bell to bet Bill at at the plus money that he's at, but it's hard to once you really run the tape on both of them. They both have questionable cardio in the third round. I got to give the slight advantage to Spike because I feel like he'll be a little bit more explosive. Still, he'll still be able to win those uh, positions where you know strength will come into a factor. And then even in the striking range, I think like Bill might be able to land some good kicks and stuff from the outside. But I still think that Spike will be able to close that distance with without much resistance. And, you know, push him up against the gauge, kind of chip away at him from there, even land big shots from there too. But this could even go early too. Like, I think that this could, uh, Spike absolutely has the, the the wherewithal and the power to possibly put out Bill within the first round or two. You know, the guy comes out like a madman in that first round and and he could definitely capitalize on some of the, the, the striking deficiencies or striking defense deficiencies that Bill Algeo shows. Um, one of those being he keeps his hands so goddamn low. So uh, yeah, I, I wanted to to bet Aljo here. I can't really do that. I'm actually you know getting closer to betting on the Spike Spike Carlisle side as I do think the guy has some potential. Um, if he controls controls himself a little bit better in that first round, which I'm not really banking on, but I still think even with that crazy style in that first round, he could still squeak out a decision if it goes there. I think he'd still be live and you know pulling off at least two rounds here. Uh, I'm still not sold on the Bill Algio experiment. You know, um, I will give him more credit than I did going into that Ricardo Lamas fight because it definitely did show up to fight there, put on a good performance against a you know a high level contender uh, who may be on the back end and obviously is retired now, but. Uh, he put on a good performance there, but that third round was was skeptical. Both guys had very tough third rounds in the last fights, and uh, yeah, I I just feel like Spike might have that extra gear in the third round to to squeeze out the decision if he needs to. Uh, so yeah, I'll go with Spike Harlow to win this fight via. I'm actually going to go by finish. I'll go either first or second round finish via KO. But even if this does get extended to the third or third round and go to a decision, I could see Spike still pulling that off too. So once again, I'll go with Spike Carlisle to win, uh, let's say second round uh, KO. Uh, but yeah, I I'm liking the line. I'm liking that it's coming down too. And again, I'm recording this on Friday before fight week. So it's currently at minus 155. Maybe during the week, fight week, it actually starts to go down more a little bit. Uh, and, and I'll be looking to possibly make a bet on it. But I do like Spike here, and I think he gets it done for sure. So once again, I'll go with Spike Harlow to win by second round KO. Miguel Beza versus Takashi Sato, and we got minus 285 on, uh, sorry, that's actually the fight doesn't go to decision. Uh, plus 205 on the fight goes to decision, but in terms of the fighters, we got minus 185 for Miguel Beza um, and plus 160 for Takashi Sato. So let's start off with Sato, who's coming off a victory over Jason Witt last time around. Uh, that was a fight where he was actually supposed to fight Ramiz Brahimaj, um, and unfortunately, Brahimaj pulls out uh, mid midway through the week, a fight week, and Jason Witt comes in. Uh, and luckily for Takashi Sato, he's able to go out there and get a quick finish um back on august 22nd he was actually supposed to fight daniel rodriguez uh the morning of the fight he had to unfortunately pull out i believe that's the night that daniel rodriguez ended up fighting uh, dwight grant because uh, dwight grant's opponent also fell out uh so you know perfect match made in heaven for those guys they go out there and bang for two and a half minutes uh and rodriguez gets his hand raised but it would have been a great fight with uh sato and rodriguez i would have really loved to seen that fight now here he draws miguel baeza 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 I'm going to go with Beza, but I feel like I've heard Baeza on the uh, commentary as well, too. But, um, yeah, I, I like what I see from uh, from Baeza in terms of Sato. We know what his style is. He he comes with a karate stance, um, you know, nice one, two down the middle when he closes the distance. Uh, but the way that he stands uh, in that karate stance leaves his le uh, lead leg 
um, you know, pretty vulnerable. And uh, that's pretty much what Miguel Beza's game plan is usually based around, is attacking that lead leg. And not just attacking that lead leg, but attacking that lead calf, uh, which, you know, really renders uh, opponents uh, immobile. And it, it really you know, messes with their uh, ability to, to move, uh, to, to strike with efficiency, uh, and takes off the power from most of their shots. And that's what I'm expecting Beza to go out there and, and do, just as he has done in his first two UFC fights. Uh, the times that we have seen Sato win, obviously the Ben Saunders fight, that's a fight where he actually got, you know, he did get hurt in that first round by Ben Saunders, but then eventually gets that finish uh, of Ben Saunders late in that fight, or not late, but, uh, you know, a minute or so into that second round. Bilal Muhammad fight, he has success in taking Bilal down in that second round, but for the majority of it, Bilal did a really good job of, you know, consistent movement, and then eventually catching uh, Sato with a couple of big shots, and then eventually taking him down and taking the back and, and getting that rear naked control, because that was a thing of beauty. Um, but uh, this fight now against Beza, it's a, it's, it's a completely different matchup than what he's seen in the past because Beza is just so uh, efficient and, 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 and controlled with his striking techniques. So let's move on to my guy, Miguel Beza. Caramel Thunder, they call him. He's fighting out of MMA Masters. Uh, that's a gym down there in Miami. Um, most people will know it as uh, Ricardo Lamas' main gym. Even though Lamas was mainly out of Chicago, he would always travel down to Miami to, to train at MMA Masters. Another notable name there is Mr. Colby Covington and I'm not sure exactly how much work these guys have been able to get in together uh, but I still think that the, the, the style that Beza brings into the game is like Per, for me, the quintessential game plan for a striker. Like you want to go out there, you want to attack the lead leg of the opponent, and not just, again, not just the lead leg, but the lead calf. And uh, that will really allow the rest of your hands to really open up. Once you get your opponent thinking about the uh, the, the leg kicks, um, you know, the reactionary for some opponents is uh, to, to reach for the leg, to try to block it or try to stifle the amount of damage rather than just trying to check it. But when that happens... Then you leave your head open, and that's where Miguel Beza, you know, has this beautiful left hook that he was able to floor Matt Brown. Or sorry, um, yeah, he was able to floor Matt Brown with after he landed a leg kick. Uses a beautiful left hand to to drop him after that. But uh, yeah, it, it's 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 so it's so fun to watch Miguel kind of like take that calculated approach, you know. Um, methodically chop down that leg and then once he sees his opponent really start to grimace and, and start to show the effects of it he starts to let his hands go but he doesn't let off the leg kicks either which is great like he dropped Hector Aldana with the leg kick you know, I mean the, the Matt Brown fight he just kept going for it kept going for it and then eventually hurt uh, Matt Brown hurt him in the first round and then finished him in the second round uh, beautifully timed left hook 18 seconds into that round um uh, Matt Brown did have success on uh, Beza, though. He did uh, end up hurting him uh, in that first round, but that truly showed the grit and the durability of Beza to kind of withstand that and bring it back. And I felt like that was like a... a not a passing of the torch fight, but a, a fight that really allowed Beza to get in a solid opponent, especially a guy like Matt Brown, who a lot of people are intimidated by. The guy has a weird style where he just goes forward and doesn't really care what's coming back his way, really pushes an opponent's. And we saw, you know, Beza kind of, uh, you know, eat the, the shot from him and, and kind of get hurt. But he did show good resiliency in terms of coming back and, uh, you know, finishing Matt Brown and having a strong performance. Not only did he get hurt in that first round, he ended up coming back and hurting Matt Brown in the same round and then eventually finishing him in that second like I said um, but I just love his style of going out there and leg kicking dudes that's that's number one and I feel like the way that Sato stands it's a perfect matchup for him to go out there and kind of implement the same game plan if not more effectively than he has in his past couple fights so Obviously, he's going to have to be wary about the counter coming down the middle from, from Sato. But outside of that, I find it hard to believe that Sato will be able to land anything harder than what Matt Brown has or even put the type of pressure that my, Matt Brown did against Beza because I think that's the best way to beat him is just stay in his face. You know, Don't let him get the leg kicks off as, as effectively as he does by just keeping him backing up, keeping him uh, you know, guessing about what's coming at him. And Sato does not seem like that type of fighter at all. Sato does have what is that, uh, d roughly a, d a 10 fight advantage on uh, Beza in terms of, um, in terms of uh, 
professional MMA fights, but I just think that Beza has really molded and crafted his game so effectively, uh, especially with the striking. It's so clean and crisp. I love watching this guy fight. Um, I think he's going to be a higher contender. I still want to see what he has to offer off of his back. So if uh, Sato does try to take this fight to the ground and, and we potentially see some holds, in Baeza's game, that's probably where it will come from. However, I think that we'll see Baeza just uh, continuously chop that lead leg down, which really will take the spring off of Sato's entries uh, and also his own his own striking. Uh, and that's where we'll see Baeza go to work. So I could see a, another finish co- incoming from Miguel Baeza here. Uh, you know, again, work that lead leg. Get the hands to come down, since they are already down a little bit for Takashi Sato. At least that uh, gives Sato another thing to worry about. And then we start getting those hands going and potentially get a knockout ourselves. So, once again, I'll go with, with uh, Takashi Sato, or sorry, I'll go with uh, Baiza to win this fight probably by second round KO. I love him in this spot. Um, I'm interested to see whether the over-under drops at one and a half or two and a half. Because if it's at two and a half, I think that's a solid spot uh, to, to hit the under if you're not that confident in Baiza. But personally, I, I really like Baiza in this spot. I think he's uh, a very solid prospect, a good win over a tough veteran last time around, and now he's going to continue his ascent in this division, in this welterweight division. So once again, I like Miguel Baza. I think he's going to get it done in the second round uh and yeah look out for caramel thunder because the guy is rolling on through amir albazi versus zagas zumagulov and we got minus 110 on both sides this fight is pretty much a pick uh when the odds dropped it did drop at minus 130 for amir uh but we've seen it be bet back down to pretty much a pick and by the looks of it the line is slowly going to start to wor- move towards zagas's way meaning that we'll get a better price on amir albazi as this fight week continues to go on. So let's actually start off with Albazi, who's coming off a triangle choke victory over Malcolm Gordon. Um, slight bit of an upset in terms of jiu-jitsu wise. Uh, he was the minus 145 favorite going into that fight. But in terms of jiu-jitsu, Malcolm Gordon is a black belt. And Amir, Amir Albazi was a purple belt when that fight went down back in July. Not 100% sure if he's gotten promoted or anything like that. But um, if you guys remember my breakdown for that fight, that was more so of a a fight where I was I was unsure about both guys. Like obviously, I know Gordon from the regional scene, being from up here in Ontario and working a couple of his shows. Uh, but Albazi was a little bit of a question mark to me. You know, even his first legitimate opponent, at least you know. Le- like legit opponent that's made it to the UFC before, which is Jose Shorty Torres. Uh, we saw Albazi come up short in that fight. You know, that was um, 1-1 going into that third round. And then uh, Torres was able to pull away with a combination of striking and grappling. Uh, when you watch Albazi's fights, most of his fights uh, are taking place in the grappling and wrestling room because that's where he likes to go. He likes to take his opponents down, um, you know, do some good work on top and then eventually look for a submission or even some ground and pound or even go out there and just, you know... Um, control his opponent from the top position very very heavy wrestler has legitimate top control and he's definitely working on his jiu-jitsu too let's look into that you know look into that malcolm gordon submission triangle choke like he had a, he did a good job of getting to the full mount once he got to the full mount he he was a little bit high which a lot of people kind of look down on but uh you know malcolm gordon did a good job of reversing but in that time albazi did an amazing job of making sure that one of his legs cleared the shoulder of uh gordon during that transition and during that transition he was able to lock up that that triangle choke and it was just a matter of time before Gordon was eventually going to tap to that beautiful beautiful setup from Albazi and it just shows on a fight to fight basis this kid is getting better each and every time his striking obviously looked a little bit more improved in that Gordon fight but I also attribute that to Gordon's lack of um Uh, comfortability in that uh, striking range you know he did start to work recently with joseph uh bazooka valentini uh but you know improvements and and confidence in your striking is not just going to come overnight or is not just going to come within one or two camps with a specific striking coach so i'm not you know rating gordon striking too high uh with that said you gotta you gotta take uh, the improvements that we've seen in Albazi striking with a grain of salt as well too because we don't 100% know how it's going to look against a much more refined striker like Zuma Gulov. Uh, now let's go on to Zuma Gulov, who's coming off a loss to uh, Holly and Paiva in his UFC debut back at UFC 251 uh, which was a great fight but you know the 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 um, 
the height and reach of Paiva and striking acumen as well too. Let's not just say that it was the 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 you know the metrics of these fighters that was actually giving them the victory. But Paiva put on a very good striking clinic as well too against Zuma Golov, who you know that's his main path to victory more often than not is outstriking his opponents so he wasn't able to do that against uh, Paiva and it even showed in terms of what he was going out there to do uh, to try to nullify the, the length and the strength of Paiva which was takedowns he went 2 of 11 for takedowns so Paiva did a really good job of uh, stuffing those takedowns and you know implementing his striking game the fight before that uh, beat uh, Bago Utinov and I'd like to highlight his last three fights before going to the UFC which is a win over Tyson Am a win over Tagir Olun Bekov which that fight, you know, after watching it back, uh, definitely a robbery. You know, Ulan Bekov definitely deserved that victory. Uh, you know, Zuma Golov, I believe that fight was taking place in Kazakhstan. So a lot of people believe that there was some tampering outside in terms of the judges there. But Tagir definitely won that fight. Another fight where the the, the strength, uh, the grappling and the reach of uh, Tagir uh, was uh, kind of the downfall of Zuma Golov. But officially, it goes down as a win for him. So good win for him there. And then the Bago Utina fight, you know, those first three rounds, he kind of struggled with, um, you know, uh, the takedowns of Bago Utinov. Bago Utinov was able to get him down, land some good shots from on top. But Zumagulov did a good job of getting back to his feet and doing some good damage on top. The longer that fight went, obviously it was a five-round fight. The longer it went, it was easier for uh, Zalgas to, go, uh, you know, stuff the takedowns of Bago Utinov and do some good damage on the, on the feet, which is what he's mainly known for, once again, is his striking. But I think he's going to have a little bit of a more difficult time here against Amir Albazi, who, you know, obviously not as good of a fighter at this point as Ali Bago Utinov, and probably Bago Utinov has much better wrestling. But, you know, how seeing how successful Amir has been with his grappling uh, and the seeming improvements, again, got to take it with a grain of salt, considering uh, the lower level of striking he was dealing with in his last fight. Um, but I could see Albazi bank in two rounds of potentially just sell grappling Zalgas here you know getting him down doing some good work on top uh you know implementing some of his jiu-jitsu run uh game as well too but uh, i'm not the most impressed with Zalgas's takedown defense and that might be the downfall of him here so uh, if this line continues to move towards Zalgas more and more i might be forced to make a play on albazi here uh at solid plus money but i like the kid's grappling style uh you know his jiu-jitsu is ever improving his striking is ever improving he's 27 years old i believe Whereas Zalgas is 32, he's probably not getting any better. Uh, that technically is usually when fighters are in their prime as well. Um, and I'm not the most impressed with Zalgas. You know, uh, even as a striker, he doesn't do anything super phenomenal. Like he's doing the the what he needs to do efficiently to get the the nod on judges' court cards whenever he's just using his striking. But when it comes to the grappling in the overall MMA game, I kind of trust the younger guy here. In a, Amir Albazi, who could potentially again bank rounds, even if he doesn't finish Zalgas with a submission or or ground and pound or anything like that, the ability to get him down seems to be there. The path to victory seems to be there, and as long as he can control, uh, you know, the the striking in the third round in terms of not getting knocked out or anything like that, I think he has a solid shot of of you know beating a, a guy like Zalgas. So uh, I'm gonna go with Albazi here. I think he wins this fight by decision. I think he does a good job of getting this fight to the ground uh, more often. Or not um we'll see what his cardio is like trying to trying to take down a guy like Zalgas time and time again so that's a little bit of a concern uh but I do like Albazi especially if he hits plus money so I'll go with Albazi to win this fight by decision uh yeah not much more to say about that fight definitely definitely like Albazi here I thought I'd like Zalgas going into this fight uh not that way on the outside now 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 that i'm on the other end i'm not that uh not that high on zalgas as much anymore he has some decent wins on his record you know what i mean tyson am uh tagiru and bekov and ali bago Tinov alone are great victories on the regional scene especially just on the regional scene but now that he's coming over to the ufc he's fighting you know guys that uh are much more complete he's probably not going to have that uh that, that bias with the judges fighting in his hometown anymore uh or his home country anymore and uh you know fights are going to be much much closer for sure and i do like albazi here to potentially make more improvements to look even better uh and, and pull off a more complete game here against zaga so once again i'll go with amir albazi to win this fight via decision josh parisian versus parker porter we got minus 210 on parisian and plus 175 on parker porter um 
Let's start off with uh, Parisian first and foremost. So he's coming off the Contender Series. Uh, he's actually been on the Contender Series, I think, twice now. Yeah, uh, the first time around, he beat Greg Rebello with a spinning back fist. And I believe he got invited to the or the Ultimate Fighter after that. Uh, lost to Michelle Batista, who pretty much used a grappling-style approach to to finish him and beat him. Uh, just the way that Tony Lopez did in, in giving... Uh, Josh Parisian, his second ever career loss. So uh, the Batista loss is obviously not on his record. It's more of an exhibition fight. Uh, and then since then, he's lost one more fight via Kimura. And then since then, now he's put together six straight victories. The Marcus Molding one, I will say that that's his second last one. That one was a little bit iffy. And that one was getting close to being a completely different result. So we saw Marcus Molding. He was 8-10 and 10 going into that fight. But he was a guy that had a very grapple-heavy game plan, and it seemed to be very effective against Josh in that, you know, as long as the, the fight landed leading up to that finish. Um, and that's where it seems like Josh seem, uh, Josh struggles the most, is when guys come and, and present a, a very grapple-heavy approach to him. Uh, you know, he's fun to watch on the feed. He has some good spinning shit, and, you know, he's... Um, uh, has decent striking, good kicks, uh, likes to throw high kicks as well too. Uh, his spinning, spinning back fist is, is very, very impressive too. Obviously, he was able to knock out Greg Rebello with that on the Contender Series over two years ago now, close to two and a half years ago now. Um, but that's where he tends to want to keep the fight, is on the feet. When he does have his opponent hurt or something, he doesn't mind taking them to the ground and, and kind of pining them out that way, just as he did with Batunga and with Chad Johnson last time around. But he seems most comfortable on the feet. Now, with that said, it seems like he does more often than not, than not always uh, fall into some sort of adversity at the beginning of his fights, and then he comes back and wins it afterwards. Like, again, I'll, I'll refer to the Marcus Malding fight where Malding pretty much took him down whenever he wanted to, but Parisian did a good job to get him back to his feet. And then for some goddamn reason, Marcus Malding goes out there and throws a spinning or uh, a flying knee, uh, and we see Parisian kind of counter with the punch right down the middle. It ends up landing on Marcus's chest and drops Marcus, uh, and it seemed to visibly hurt him, and then he obviously follows up with a bunch of ground and pound and gets to finish that way. The Chad Johnson one was interesting too because he landed a beautiful knee in the clinch, kind of threw Chad Johnson off of balance, um, and then he ends up in his mount. Uh, after you know threatening with a, a straight arm, like I, I believe it was either an Americano or a Kimura, but... Um, Threatening with that, getting Chad Johnson's attention to that. And then he, uh, you know, when he kind of fails on that, right away he steps over to the mount and then starts raining down bombs completely, you know, bloodies up Chad Johnson's face. It looks, it was one of the, one of the more brutal TKO finishes that I've seen. Um, like you see Chad Johnson's face, like go from completely clean to just absolutely bloody, um, you know, complete, just blood coming out of the nose. Uh, some vicious ground and pound from Parisian for sure. Now, luckily for Parisian, this is a fight with Parker Porter where he doesn't really have to worry about the ground game as much. You know, Parker Porter seems to be like a guy that wants to keep the fight on the feet, let his hands go, let his kicks go, um, and not really take the fight to the ground. That doesn't seem to be a, uh, a priority in his mind. The guy's 10-6. and six. He's most notably known for being a guy that fought uh, John Jones way back in the day. I believe it was his third ever fight. Lost that fight in 36 seconds. And between 2013 and 2015, he took about two years off. And even 2015 to 2018, he takes another two and a half years off there. Um, and since his comeback, and now that he stayed relatively busy, uh, he's put together a record of three and two, obviously making his UFC debut as well uh, against Chris Dalkis. Dalkis just went out there, and Andrew Shorty was a much quicker fighter, sharper hands, more accurate pinpoint punches as well, too. His right down the middle was just catching Parker whenever he wanted, and then eventually we saw, you know, a beautiful knee set up the finish for Chris Dalkis, and, uh, or sorry, I believe it was the the straight that set up the knee would set up the, the ground and pound uh, for Dalkis. So, unfortunate loss for Parker Porter in his UFC debut. Um, now, with the line being where it is, minus 210, a part of me feels like it's a little bit too wide. You know, uh, then again, Parker Porter doesn't really have much to offer, uh, you know, that Josh Parisian hasn't already seen. You know, I, I believe that uh, Parisian will have the speed advantage. Um, in terms of the size, you know, I'm not taking into consideration Parker Porter's fucking thunder, th thunder thighs for days. Uh, 
Parisian is 6'4", 79 inch reach. We got 6 foot 75 inch reach for uh, Parker Porter. So obviously Parker Porter is more often than not at a size disadvantage when it comes to the height, but in terms of denseness and thickness, like triple C thickness, uh, you know, Parker Porter is probably at the top of the division for that. I don't think I've ever seen anybody's thighs as ridiculously big as this guy's. Like, like insultingly big almost you know what i mean like it looks like the, the ufc shorts are going to tear off his thighs at any given moment if he just steps a different way or just you know tries to tries to sprawl on somebody the, those those shorts are just ready to fucking tear um it's got to be a bit shopping for that guy you know just being only six foot but having thickness like that is just beyond ridiculous but let's let's get back to the the, the x's and o's of this fight um what I've seen from Parker Porter is okay, like a decent striking, good leg kicks. Obviously, you better have good leg kicks if you have thighs like that. Um, I feel like he could utilize them a little bit better, but just doesn't. Uh, he's 31 years old, or sorry, Parisian is 31 years old. Parker Porter is 35. So if anybody's on the decline, it's definitely Porter, as we saw in the last fight. Um, again, the the kryptonite for Parisian seems to be anybody that wants to initiate in the gra grappling, and that doesn't really seem like the the route that parker porter really wants to take um yeah i, I like freezing here i'm a little bit skeptical of the price tag here uh you know if this is lined at two and a half in terms of the total uh, I, I would look at possibly betting the under here as I believe that both guys take a little bit of time to really get comfortable in the cage before they're able to get a finish or get finished. Um, if it's at one and a half, I, I'd probably stay away from it. Maybe the over one and a half would be a solid spot. Um, but yeah, I, I do like Parisian here. I think he gets it done probably second round. Um, yeah, tough to to get the, the best read on this fight as I believe that Neither of them are really going to be like top 15, top 10 guys. Uh, Prezian, I believe, has a big higher ceiling, obviously with being four years younger, showing a little bit more agile of uh, striking and moving nature from him. Uh, but yeah, I do like uh, I do like Prezian here. I think he gets it done. Uh, you know, maybe he faces some adversity early, just as he has in his past couple of fights. But I should... Um, I do see him going out there and getting the finish here against Porker. Who just, Porker. Wow. God damn it. I fucking did it. I know my man Clint st stumbled on it when he first broke down a, a Parker Porter fight, but I didn't think I'd actually get that Freudian slip out. But here we are. So, uh, yeah, I, once again, I'll go with uh, Josh Prezian to finish Parker Porter um, probably second round at some point. Uh, again, being lighter on the feet, probably being quicker on the feet, too. Uh, and I see him eventually catching Porter with something. So once again, Josh Parisian to win this fight via second round KO. Devin Clark versus Anthony Smith. We got minus 115 on Anthony Smith and plus or one, minus 105 on Devin Clark. Anthony Smith did open at a minus 145 favorite, and we've seen that line slowly drift down. And it makes absolute sense after, you know, the certain run uh, or at least the most recent run that Anthony Smith has been on post his John Jones fight. So let's uh, let's talk about Anthony Smith a little bit. So he had that John Jones fight uh, March of last year, and now... Um, in that amount of time, he's beaten Alexander Gustafson via fourth round finish where it looked like Gustafson was just completely out of it come that fourth round. Uh, and then he lost to Glover Teixeira in May and Alexander Rakic this past August as well, too. But uh, the past, I'd say, seven rounds, he's looked like a fighter that, you know, is far removed from the one that we saw against Volkan Uzdemir, against Alexander Gustafsson, even against John Jones, a little bit of success that he had in that fight. But uh, yeah, he, I don't know what happened in that, you know, the, the middle of that second round against Glover Teixeira. But since then, you know, it's just been completely down downwards for him. Um, we saw him, you know, at his best in that first round against Glover Teixeira, but I'm unable to put him away. And uh, I'm not sure if he gassed or, you know, just had a complete adrenaline dump, but he just completely shit the bet after that uh lost every single round after that and then obviously got finished lost a couple of teeth too in the process um and then lost that uh fight in the fifth round against Glover to share via ground and pound Alexander Rakic was very very close to finishing him a handful of times uh beautiful calf kicks beautiful leg kicks from Alexander um even post fight I believe uh Anthony Smith was talking about 
how th- they were the hardest kicks he's ever felt from Rakic. So you got to give some kudos to Rakic there. But it's hard to believe also that Anthony Smith is 49 fights into his career, uh, 49 pro fights into his career, and he's 32 years old. Now, when you look at fighters like this, you don't look at, okay, there are 32, so they still probably have some good amount of fight left in them. You got to also take into consideration the fight miles that are on their body too, right? Uh, Approaching, this is going to be his 50th fight. 50th fight since, when did he turn pro? 2008. Let's throw in uh, about five, six amateur fights as well too. So 56 MMA fights in total. Insane for Anthony Smith, but uh, I think it's starting to catch up to him at this point. And a lot of people thought it was catching up to him in his first, uh, you know, UFC stint, uh, where he well he lost his fight to Hodger Gracie in Strike Force. Then they got absorbed into the UFC. Lost to Antonio Brago Neto, uh, Neto I should say, sorry, and then lost to Josh Neer, and then went on a little bit of a run before making it back to the UFC. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight straight wins over questionable competition you could say as well makes it back to the UFC loses to Cesar Fajera uh, goes on a three-fight winning streak uh, that has Mutapcic Andrew Sanchez Hector Lombard then loses Tiago Santos then goes up to light heavyweight beats Rashad Evans the ghost of Rashad Evans beats the ghost of Shogun Hua beats Volkan Uzdemir who I believe was coming off a title fight that year as well too um, and then gets that title fight loses to John Jones beat Alexander Gustafsson then comes back in 2020 and loses two fights in a row. So the body language of Anthony Smith in those two fights, though, again, in those last seven rounds, have been very, very underwhelming. Uh, obviously, had a couple good moments against Glover in that first round. But in the Rackets fight, didn't really have much. You know, had traded a couple of leg kicks, landed one good right hand, counter right hand, I should say. But after that, like, it, he was just completely getting dummied and handled. Like, it didn't seem like it was too hard to take him down either, which is very, very concerning. The, I I'm, I want to emphasize the body language of Anthony Smith because, because it's very, very discouraging. You don't want to be putting your money on a guy that's showing that. It's one thing to show it against Glover to share in later rounds of that fight, but to be completely flat in all three rounds against Alexander Rakic, very, very, uh, you know, very, very discouraging. And something that you don't want to go out there and be like, okay, I want to put my money on Anthony Smith in his next fight. That's... That would be stupid of you to think, to to be like, okay, I, I, I'm confident in Anthony Smith here. Um decent jujitsu but we saw zero of it in both of those fights zero both both fighters Glover Tischer and Alexander Rackers did a really good job of maintaining top position and landing big big shots as well too now he's gonna have to deal with another grapple heavy attack here from Kevin Devin Clark I was about to say Kevin Dark <laughs> that'd be great eh um Kevin Clark um but yeah with, with Devin Clark you got a guy who's gonna be chasing the takedown it, just as he showed in his last fight against Alonzo Benefield uh he wants to go out there and try to take you down ASAP especially if, if you have some good power coming back your way now he pushed Alonzo Benefield to his first ever decision first ever second round as well and uh you know ate some good shots in that first round uh was man managed to to fight through it i think one of those punches from alonzo menafield even landed on his eye which uh you know kind of made it blow up a little bit and he had to deal with some visual vision issues in that fight but he really pushed through that fight um you know he was all of eight uh leading up to finally landing his first take takedown against alonzo menafield but it was the pressure the cage clinch the work against the cage that really allowed him to push that push away from alonzo and start to really drain the power from alonzo as well too which really uh you know downplayed the amount of power that was coming his way um the Taquan Townsend fight, I'm not even going to touch on that. Everybody goes out there and beat, beats Townsend at this point in time. Uh, the Ryan Spann fight obviously got caught in that. And then the Darko Stosic fight did a good job of staying away from the power and then pulling off the victory in that fight too. But uh, here with Anthony Smith, it's... I, I just... I don't know what it is. I still don't feel comfortable putting the money on him. And obviously the line movement obviously shows that a lot of people are more confident in Clark than they are in Smith in this position. And I'd have to agree. Like if I were to pick a side here, just as I do on this podcast every week, um, I'm going to be going with Devin Clark. I feel like he has a little bit more left in the tank. He shows that he wants to be in there. Um, may not be the most exciting of fighters, but he actually goes out there and, and tries to get the W by any means necessary. So uh, I could see him being more successful with the takedowns than he was against Alonzo Menafield. I feel like he will, you know, have decent uh, 
you know, success on the feet. Uh, I don't think we'll see him die for a takedown just as he did in the Alonzo Minifield fight right off the bat. I feel like we'll see him play it out on the feet, try to keep Anthony Smith thinking that this is going to be a stand-up fight and then pull out the takedown. Um, given the, the horrendous takedown defense we've seen from Anthony Smith as of late, I have no doubt about it that we'll see Devin Clark complete a couple takedowns here. I'm not sure in the finishing ability of Devin Clark uh, against Anthony Smith, who's shown good durability, even though he's shown a, a lack of urgency in his fights. He he still kind of sticks it out in those fights. Um, but I do like Devin Clark. I think he will be the one getting the fight to the ground, pushing the fight, maybe pushing Anthony Smith up against the cage, uh, trying to drain the power from him too, just as he did from Alonzo, uh, and then drag this fight to the ground and kind of just not lay and pray, but do enough on the ground to kind of keep the fight on the ground and, and, and stay active enough so that the referee doesn't stand it up. Again, I like Devin Clark here. Hard for me to make a case for Anthony Smith given his um, you know, recent performances. Obviously, the guy has some decent power in his hands, just as he put out, you know, Rashad Evans and Shogun Hua in the past, and even uh, Alexander Gustafson, even though that was kind of like a more of a slip than it was <clears throat> more of a slip than it was anything else. Um yeah, I, I like Clark here. Not enough to actually put the money down on him. The line's not too bad, given that it's uh, at a pick em. If you give me a stronger plus money on Clark here, maybe I'd be a little bit more in tune to or inclined to actually bet him. Um, I think the line here would be Devin Clark to win by decision, as I feel like that's probably his best way to get the victory here and get his hand raised. But yeah, I'll go with Devin Clark. Uh, better wrestling, obviously. Um you know, will have good enough top control, I believe, to keep Anthony Smith down and to stay out of submissions. Uh, and his chin, you know, it's it's okay. It's 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 gone through darker days. And from what we've seen thus far, um, I feel like it's it's trustworthy enough here against Anthony Smith, who just seems like he just doesn't even want to be in there anymore. It seems like so. Uh, once again, I'll go with Devin Clark to win this fight via decision. Uh, but in terms of a, a total bet. I'm, I'm probably just going to pass. I, I will definitely pass on this fight. I'm actually, actually, you know what? I am interested in seeing what the over-under is. I, they'll probably set it at two and a half. If it is at one and a half, for some goddamn reason, I definitely take the over. But at two and a half, uh, a little bit more skeptical. Um, but I do think that the, the most uh, probable outcome here would be a Devin Clark decision. So once again, and finally, I will say uh, Devin Clark to win this fight via decision. For the main event, we got Curtis Blades versus Derek Lewis, minus 310 for Curtis Razor Blades, and plus 255 for the Black Beast, Derek Lewis. And um, this fight's pretty straightforward to break down. Um, you know, it, it all depends on which side of the coin that you feel more stronger or strongly about, I should say. Um, let's start off with Curtis Razor Blades first and foremost. He's coming off a victory over Alexander Volkov, which caps off a, a four-fight winning streak that he's currently on, uh, which started off with Justin Willis, Shamil Abdurahimov, Junior Dos Santos, and Alexander Volkov. Two of those four he ended up finishing. Um, and then most recently, he had that decision victory over Volkov. Now, he's 14-2. and two. His only two losses have come to Francis Ngannou, um, both via stoppage. Obviously, that first one uh, was a stoppage because his eye was shut, and then the second one was actually a clean knockout by Francis Ngannou. Um, it seems like he has issues dealing with guys that have legitimate power, but then again, he's gone out there and beaten guys like Mark Hunt, Alistair Overeem, uh, Junior Dos Santos, who at times seems to have power, uh, and Volkov, who may not have power, but can have accumulative uh, power for sure, or, or at least uh, can accumulate damage over a larger amount of time. But we saw Curtis Blades go out there and and wrestle him quite effectively. You know, he did have trouble keeping him down and, and uh, you know, dishing out damage at the same time. Uh, we saw in the later rounds, rounds four and five, we saw Volkov kind of get to his feet a little bit quicker, um, was able to stuff some takedowns, even get a takedown of his own, uh, and then do some damage on Chris Blaze on the feet, who seemed like he was having some trouble uh, really managing his gas tank. And that's a little bit suspect to me here because Derek Lewis... You know, say what you want about the guy. The guy is probably not the most technical guy that you'll see out there, but he is durable as hell. Uh, the only time he got finished, well, he's gotten finished a, co a, a couple of times now. So Junior Dos Santos, that one, uh, I believe he had uh, alluded it to, or at least attributed it to um, having severe back issues. Uh, his back was really, really fucked up for that fight. And then obviously the Daniel Cormier fight got absolutely outclassed in that fight. Uh, and Mark Hunt uh, knocks him out. Uh, in a fight where I believe that uh, Derek Lewis was really, truly the the the, um, 
the the t- more tired man in that spot. Sean Jordan also head kicked him, knocked him out five years ago. And then Matt Mitrione, kind of same thing, uh, over six years ago that finished him. So uh, the, I still believe in his durability. Like guys usually have him in really, really bad spots. Alexander Volkov, Marcin Tybura, uh, Blagoy Ivanov. Like some of these guys, even Alexei Olenek, they have him in bad spots, but somehow, some way, he ends up surviving. And that's what it comes down to. Like, it's heart, his durability, and then obviously the reliance on his power because if he touches anybody's chin, whether it's minute one, minute, you know, 14, minute 24, I think he's still going to be able to carry that and sustain that power throughout his fights. Now, with Curtis Blades, we more than likely will see him be able to secure takedowns in that first and second round. Now, it's up to him, though. Well, maybe not up to him, but... He's going to have to really put his foot on the gas, in my opinion, to to get uh, Derek Lewis out of there in those first two rounds, as I believe that the longer that this fight goes on, the harder it will get for him to hold Derek Lewis down, who, you know, doesn't really have the most technical get-ups. It's just, all right, fuck it, let's get up kind of technique. Like, it's probably, you know, you wouldn't really advise it to anybody, but given how big he is and how hard he is to hold down, uh, I find it hard to believe that Curtis Blades, uh, you know, in rounds three, four, and five is going to have success in holding Derek Lewis down and getting off good shots. You know, he wasn't uh, as successful in doing that against Alexander Volkov, who, you know, I I believe off of his back probably gives a little bit more issues to Curtis Blades in terms of being able to, you know, to to, to really... uh, secure position enough for Curtis Blades to rain down some damage I feel like Derek Lewis does a good job of like tying guys up but then it's just literally his get-ups like he just you know turns his uh turns his belly to the mat and just starts like posting up on his on his hands and his knees and slowly starts to get back up and then once he gets back to his feet if Curtis Blades is huffing and puffing in front of him and he eats one of those big shots by Lewis we know Lewis has those blitzes in him you know albeit they are small but whenever they 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 do land and they are effective it's very very devastating and I absolutely could see in a scenario where he can knock out Curtis Blades here so minus 310 for me a little bit too much for Curtis Blades uh in this matchup obviously skill for skill Curtis Blades hasn't blown out, but Derek Lewis just has that special thing about him that he could just, he could be losing the fight for, you know, 14, 24 minutes or whatever it is and still go out there and knock you out. Um, Curtis Blades obviously working on his hands and it helps that his, you know, his wrestling or the threat of his takedowns allow his hands to open up a little bit more. Um, but I don't, I don't know how much he's really going to be wanting to mess on the feet here with Derek Lewis. With Derek Lewis, you're talking about a guy that has the most finishes in heavyweight history in the UFC um, and probably has, you know, probably second hardest punch in that heavyweight division behind Francis Ngannou. Uh, and we've seen every time Francis goes in there and fights Blades, he's able to put him out or at least finish him. So I think Derek Lewis has a solid chance of being a very live dog here, especially at the, uh, the, the crazy odds that he's at. And I've kind of learned my lesson in terms of betting against him uh, in that Alexander Volkov fight. <clears throat> Just as you think you have that fight wrapped up, you know, he goes out there and knocks out my guy Volkov in 13 seconds, with 13 seconds left in the fight. With Derek Lewis here, though, um, I'm kind of believing in his durability. I think he'll, he will be able to kind of take whatever Curtis Blades throws on at him on the ground and be able to kind of shrimp and, and get back to his feet when he needs to. Um yeah, I'm interested to see the pros that Blades take. Is he is he gonna you know get this fight to the ground and kind of just lay and pray and try to sustain his cardio throughout the 25 minutes and kind of learn from the mistakes of that Volkov fight, or do we see him go out there try to put out Derek Lewis in the first two rounds and then start sucking wins in round three, four, and five if he's not able to get Derek Lewis out of there? So. Uh, I would rather play the value side, in my opinion, which is Derek Lewis at that plus 260 range that he's currently at. I think he's going to get even worse. I think people are going to continue to buy in on that Curtis Blades uh, juice. But my play actually is going to be uh, waiting on Derek Lewis to, or at least inside the distance for Derek Lewis to drop. It's going to be slightly you know, better odds. Not significantly, I'd say. I'd say it's slightly better odds. Um, but th- th- there's no way I see Derek Lewis winning a decision here. So his only path to victory, in my opinion, is getting that finish, getting that uh, knockout, getting that inside the distance prop to hit. So that's the spot that I'm going to be looking at. I'm not looking to really hammer it crazy or anything like that. Obviously, the, I, I, I'm i I'm more of a firm believer of picking the guy that has the better technique and better overall skill, just as I have in past Derek Lewis fights. But Derek Lewis is just a fucking exception. He's that guy that's going to make it a lot more difficult for guys who should go out there and cruise. You know what I mean? So um, 
the, the pick's going to be Derek Lewis here. You know, uh, I, I think he does sustain the wrestling of, uh, or at least um, handle the wrestling of Curtis Blades. Uh, you know, stays away from getting finished and then just pops to his feet and knocks this guy out. And uh, you guys know me. I don't really like banking on guys that have such a small window to uh, of a path to victory. But with Derek Lewis, again, he's such an exception. And I feel like this is another spot where he could take advantage uh, and get back to his feet and, and possibly finish a guy like Curtis Blades. You know, he did have some trouble against Derek, uh, Daniel Cormier. Um, but again, that, that last performance from Curtis Blades, if anything, it kind of dropped his stock. Like, it, it was surprising at how much his cardio seemed to be affected there. And I think if he's having that much trouble holding Volkov down, he's going to have just as much trouble holding Derek Lewis down and even more trouble dealing with the power that's coming back his way once Derek Lewis decides to just let it loose and, and let his hands go and let that power go. So, um, yeah, do not parlay Curtis Blades here. On paper, obviously, it seems like he should win and absolutely dust Derek Lewis here, but Derek Lewis is always fucking live. And if you're going to give me plus 250, possibly plus 300, even on the inside the distance line, I'm taking Derek Lewis every fucking day. The guy always has an opportunity to land, and he has ridiculous power. He always makes people crumble, um, you know, survive again on the ground against Alexei Olenek for pretty much an entire round. Um, you know, say what you want about Olenek's fight IQ in terms of spamming that uh, scarf hold choke. Um, but yeah, I, I still like Lewis here. Um, yeah, he, he's definitely the value side, has a ton of value, uh, and I think he'll get that knockout of Derek, uh, of Curtis Blades. I'll say maybe round three or four, we'll see him get the finish, so I'd, I would love to see what that, what those round three and four props look like, because those might be worth a little bit of a sprinkle here, but if Curtis Blades struggles to get him out of there in the first or second round, rounds three, four, and five are going to be hell for him, guaranteed. So once again, I'll go with Derek Lewis to win by either third or fourth round KO. And those are the breakdowns. I hope you guys enjoyed them. I hope they were informative. I told you guys not the deepest card in terms of betting. Also, just a note, an asterisk, that Parisian and Porter fight. Very, very tricky. I believe I uh, said Parisian on this breakdown. I did end up going with Porter on the, the breakdown that I did with Clint for the Die Hard podcast. Uh, but I am more than happy to say that my strongest lean for that fight is the over one and a half. It was at plus 125 when I just saw it a couple minutes ago. That's where I think I might put my money if I do end up betting on that fight. Otherwise, that bet is a complete pass. However, that over one and a half is very, very, very intriguing. All right. Um, once again, thanks for the support. Make sure you guys hit subscribe if you haven't already. Um, vocal prompts are apparently help that a lot. So hit subscribe. Hit the like as well, too, because apparently that helps me get into the algorithm of these MMA picks and MMA predictions. Because apparently, according to a lot of commenters, I should be much bigger than I am. I'm out 1,600 subscribers right now. Let's get to 10,000, guys. Come on. Help a brother out. Um and lastly, as I always plug, make sure you guys check out the Patreon in the description below. The link is there. You guys can click on that. Five bucks a month gets you a ton of content. Probably the best uh, bang for your buck in terms of MMA protection content, MMA gambling content. I got you guys covered head to toe. Five bucks a month. Super cheap and super informative. So make sure you guys check that out. All right. Good luck on your best this weekend. I'll see you guys on Friday for the odds final weigh-in stream with my guy Cody Saftik with uh, MMA Prediction Guru and Just Bleed. We always break down the card from top to bottom after the weigh-ins. Give us our give your final thoughts. And then lastly, on 1 p.m. at 1 p.m. on fight day, every fight day, 1 p.m. Eastern, I do a live stream on my MMA channel here. Uh, you know, just taking all questions, comments, and concerns, uh, last-minute comments, questions, and concerns from everybody in the chat. Everybody in the chat has a part in the show. So if you want to join on, uh, you guys can drop your comments in there, and I'd be happy to answer them for you guys. And uh, yeah, it's becoming a very, very fun show. I can't believe 60 minutes goes by just like that whenever I do that stream. So shout out to everybody. And the numbers continue to grow on a week-to-week basis for that show. I can't wait to get it to, to higher, higher numbers because I love answering all your questions. And it makes the time go by very, very quickly. All right. This is longer than an intro sh- than it should be. Subscribe, like, Patreon. That's all I should be saying. Good luck on your best this week, and I'll see you guys for the stream on Friday and Saturday.